What's up, Accelerators? Welcome to Normalize It, the show where we speak about and explore the business of disability inclusion and accessibility. I'm your host, Cam Baudouin, and on each episode, I'll be interviewing leaders, professionals, and people with lived experiences. And we'll be discussing the challenges, successes, and strategies on how to make this world a more inclusive place. As you know, many organizations are still trying to figure out disability inclusion through a trial and error method. That's inefficient. Stick around to the end of the show to find out how we can fix that. So whether you're an advocate, entrepreneur, business owner, stakeholder, VP, or just someone who's interested in the world of disability inclusion, this show is for you. Let's dive into it. Gayatri, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. It's so great to have you on the show. It is is so absolutely uh, wonderful to be talking about this topic here. So what do we need to know as a baseline before we get into this conversation? That there is no baseline, that uh, this conversation is um, is about is about doing something that is uh, different from what we are used to and, uh, you know, really about the possibilities of um, an approach to disability employment that has not been tried before. So I, I would say there is no baseline. That's what, that's how we are working, right? Our work is all about you know, not worrying about whether there's a baseline or not. It's just starting to just keep keep doing, right, with a very strong bias for action. And we have a great, very enthusiastic team of people who are, some of them are actually on this on this chat and uh, are very excited about what they're doing. So yeah, there is no baseline. So what do you mean by a different approach then? You know, one of the questions that I ask people is that, let me ask you, where do you think you acquired most of the skills that you think make you successful today? I gave the example of Wendy's, right? So Mm -hmm. probably for me that I got my first job at 15. And so I was working at school. I was working while going to high school. And really it was, it was from there mostly through employment and just kind of, you know, that personal development uh, from there. But I've always been, I've always worked, you know, there's, I, I, I don't remember a time where I was not active doing something and trying to, trying to make money. Is it accurate to say that you acquired most of your skills that make you successful today on the job? Absolutely. That is what we are after. The approach that we have taken to disability employment is that most people with disabilities, especially people with cognitive disabilities, they do not have the opportunity to learn on the job because the traditional approach of matching candidates to jobs does not work for them because most of them don't qualify as candidates. They do not have the skills to apply for most of the jobs that are out there. That does not mean that they don't have the ability to work. So what we need to do differently is change the approach in the field of employment, essentially to identify the opportunities for us to bring people with cognitive disabilities into the workforce, create jobs for them that do not exist, and give them the opportunity to learn on the job. Because that's where I think most of us acquired a lot of the skills that we can say make us successful today. And that's where I think the approach is different. Got it. So when you talk about that approach, like walk me through a little bit of the approach right now. I mean, I know how I got a job. Right. Yeah. What would yeah. the what's the current approach to offering people with cognitive disabilities uh, a, a current job? You said something about matching. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So it's it's a very simple idea, and it started with the question, um, you know, why are there so few people with disabilities in the workforce? In 2018, I was asked to lead a web accessibility project for a large e-commerce company. You know, I was overwhelmed by the amount of resources that are available, as many people are, and they're just starting out. But the one question that kept coming back at me was. Where are the people with disabilities? How can I understand their lived experience? How can I understand why accessibility is important by talking to the people that it is solving for? But the reality is that most of the people that are having these conversations in, especially in the tech uh, environment, Mm -hmm. are not people with disabilities. And which is the reason why you have so many products and services out there that are not accessible. Right. And so I could not find the answer for almost a year. And I decided I'm going to go find the answer myself. And so I went and hired them myself into an internship program for three months. It was a paid internship program and it was in a group of uh, young people between the ages of 18 and 25 with cerebral palsy, autism and, um, and Down syndrome. And I was blown away by what I learned from that experience. I taught them about web accessibility. I did project based work with them and it was all about on the job training Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, project based learning. And a few months after that, a young man uh, on the team, Rohan Bhupati Raju, he called me every day for three months asking me to keep the internship going because he said he was not done learning Mm -hmm. and he wanted me to find him a job in tech. 
And that is what changed our mission. I think we pivoted our mission to focus entirely on that. So to answer your question, the approach is very simple. On one hand, we work with people with cognitive disabilities on building marketable skills. Mm -hmm. And this is not uh, learning how to use um, Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. Like this is uh, marketing. We have people on the team who are focusing on demand gen emails. We have uh, people working on um, web accessibility testing, localization testing, security privacy testing. We have people learning about podcasting and video editing. So there's lots of these skills that will help them get employed. But the critical part of our model that is really groundbreaking and different is that we work with employers who want to invest in potential. Mm -hmm. And when we work with these employers, we come in not through a a DEI team or an HR team. We actually come in through the business unit and work with the executive sponsors to understand where in the organization um, are there um, repeatable structured you know, structured repetitive work in the organization. And every organization has that. So we identify very clear deliverables and projects. And then we we train these individuals to do those jobs and then support them throughout the work program, whether you call it an internship or an apprenticeship. We provide the support because a lot of these individuals have never been in a work environment. Right. And that model we successfully executed not once, but twice last year. Very cool. And uh, the uh, the results were astounding. I mean, all of these young people who were placed in these companies uh, blew past everyone's expectations. Mm-hmm. They were the ones who were asking questions in meetings. They were always providing, you know, updates on their projects. And they were, you know, delivering all expectations on the projects on time uh, and to the best of their abilities and blew everybody uh, away with, with their work ethic. So I think we have a blueprint that we have proved to the world that people with cognitive disabilities have always been eager to work, have always had the ability to work. It's what's missing is that we have not created the opportunities for them. And that's what we want to change. Yeah, you know, you said something there that I've spoken about before and that we in the in the West, North American capitalist society, like we put so much personal value and Mm -hmm. personal worth Mm -hmm. on our work. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we put so much, you know, we think of how valuable we are in society, in, in, in our groups, in our companies, based on the amount of dollars that we receive and, mm-hmm. and the amount of work that we can output. And mm-hmm. what I see of what you're talking about here, and I liked what you said earlier on about not just teaching skills around, you know, Word or, you know, Excel. We're talking about real marketable skills, because when I need to go out and hire somebody to edit my podcast or and I need yep. to go and find somebody who can help out with crafting emails. There is somebody out there who can mm-hmm. help out. And, like, you know, mm-hmm. gone are the days where we need to put somebody, and that sounds so negative, put somebody in a call center. And that's, I don't mean that as a negative point of view, but I remember yep. a time where that was considered all that somebody with a cognitive disability would be able to yeah. do. And I remember I used to work at call centers. I worked alongside yep. people with cognitive disabilities. Yeah. Yep. And that was all they were offered at the time. And I see this as like, you know, the next step, the next evolution. Absolutely. Right. Even if, if I may add one more thing, right. I I want to reiterate something here. There are many approaches out there um, today that um, aim to train people with cognitive disabilities and they throw them at, you know, training programs around testing or, Mm -hmm. you know, structured repeatable tasks that they believe like call center, things like that. Right. And I'm not saying that they don't work. Yes, they do create employment, but not for all. I feel right. that it needs a personalized approach because there are, you know, five people with Down syndrome on my team. Not one of them is like the other. And and I think that that is what's different. And of course, it's a it's it's a problem that I need to solve uh, as we scale because it's you know it's difficult to scale a very personalized approach, but it has worked. And then one other thing I want to point out is that, um, and you'll see this on our website if you go under resources and look for the 5.9 case study, is that what we did at 5.9 is truly groundbreaking work. When we walked in, we walked in with a team that had a basic understanding of web accessibility that Mm -hmm. could go in and teach their team about how to think about web accessibility. The executive sponsor, Jayashree Rajan, who is the VP of marketing at 5.9, was very clear that what she wanted for Rohan and Rojin at 5.9 was when they walked out of that internship that they have acquired many new skills. Very cool. She came up with a list of projects. And in fact, I was quite nervous when I saw that list of projects because there was demand gen, there was localization, there was Mm -hmm. A-B testing, there was Google Analytics, this path factory, content management. 
And I literally looked at the list and went, I don't know if this, these guys can learn this, but she was right. She was right that if you create the right environment, right. if you provide the training in a manner that they learn best, and most importantly, bring them into a culture that accepts them for who they are, they can be valuable contributing members of the workforce. We've already proven that. Right. I'm, I'm not telling you an idea. I'm not telling you a dream. I'm telling you what we've already done. Right, right. Now tell me a little bit more about that that environment that you're helping create, because it sounds like, I know from it, like what we're really fighting in, in the world is, is inter a lot of internal biases, right? Like that's really at the root core of, of yeah. what people in our industry are combating. I know there's a lot of, you know, my boss hates this and, you know, nobody wants to listen to us, but no, no, no. What we're combating is, is 10,000 years of internal biases and societal yes. biases against people with disabilities. When you're taught, when we're talking about the environment, talk a little bit more about the environment of encouraging meaningful dialogue and change and understanding. Cause I think that's, that's really at the core of, of, of a lot of where I think you have to start. I'd like to hear more about that. First of all, I, I don't charge for my services. A lot of people think that we ask people with disabilities to pay as a fee for the mm. training. Actually, the training is free. They don't have to pay anything. I fund it. I, it's all self-funded, wow. right? I pay wow. for the tools. Amazing. I create the training myself. I don't charge for training. All I ask for is a commitment uh, of their time and their effort. And that's all we look for and the work ethic, right? But when they walk into my home office, um, they don't walk into a training center or a workshop. It's a, it's a work environment. It's I've created sandboxes. I've created project-based work. So when they come in, they believe they're coming into work. And we have created the same work environment where, you know, we have projects that mm -hmm. each person is responsible for. They have deliverables that they are held accountable for. Mm -hmm. They work in teams. They use all kinds of productivity tools from Asana to Slack to Zoom to email to, I mean, you name it. It's We're kind of everywhere. But to answer your question, what really needs to happen. And I say this to a lot of people, people ask me like, what's your, you know, do you want to be this next big unicorn and disrupt the industry and blah, blah, blah. I think that's wonderful. But if I do my job right in the next five years, there would be no need for me. Right. Because we would have created a blueprint that every company can use. Mm -hmm. The Microsofts, the Facebooks, the Intuits, the Apples, the Walmarts, I mean, all these big companies out there already have lots of money, the resources, um, in fact, people who are a lot more talented than I am, uh, who can very easily create programs that will bring people with disabilities into their companies, yep. create an environment in which they can thrive and identify jobs that they can do. It is possible. And my job is to show that it is possible. Today, the way the model works is that we are actively looking for employers who are willing to work with us to yep. test this out. And yeah, it is tough to do business with people saying, hey, oh, you should just do this because it's a huge leap of faith, or you should do this because this is altruistic. But what we have proven with the last inter two internships that we have done is that it's actually good for business. Absolutely. Not only are these individuals coming in and taking on a large portion of structured repetitive work off the plates of your you know, employees who should be focusing on strategic projects that they don't have time for. You've also created an opportunity for an individual with a, a disability to contribute to your workforce. It is a tremendous contribution to your culture, the environment, right? The team started communicating better. The team felt like they were a lot more cohesive. They felt like they were, they had more compassion for each other just because Rohan and Rojin were present in those meetings. Just their presence changed the way the team was communicating with each other and working with each other. And no one expected a woman with a cognitive disability, a woman with cerebral palsy and a young man with Down syndrome to be able to do what they have, they were able to do. And, and literally the team was like, wow, this, this kind of work ethic we have not seen with any of the other interns that we have worked with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, I got calls daily from the executive sponsors and managers that were working with Rohan and Rojin guys, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing with your interns that we can do with our other interns? Because their work ethic is above, you know, the rest. And in fact, they were going shoulder to shoulder with interns from Ivy League colleges. Yep. Uh, Rohan and Rojin have barely uh, got through high school, right? They don't have college degrees. But what we have done with our work is we've proven that anyone can learn if they are taught based on how they learn best. Anyone can learn if they are put in an environment where they are accepted for who they are and they can be valuable contributing members of the workforce. This group of people, even within the 
disability community are the most marginalized group of people. They are mm -hmm. invisible because people assume that they cannot advocate for themselves. Yep. People assume that they're not capable of working. People assume that they don't want to work, but that's not accurate. I mm -hmm. think we have proven that not once, but twice and actually three times now. We've had three very successful internships. I think it's time that not just tech employers, I think employers in overall, all of us, right? Whether it's a you're a small business or a medium-sized business or a large company, I think we need to think differently about em disability employment. Don't ask a disabled person what your qualifications are. Right. Give them a job, teach them what you know. Yeah. Make them the qualified candidate you are looking for. Mm -hmm. Look for willingness. Look for eagerness to learn and work. And you have create you have found the most loyal employee you can imagine. That is the shift we want to bring about. Absolutely. The shift from focusing on disability to focusing on discovering ability. And I think that we all will benefit from that. Right. Absolutely. And especially these days with all the tools that are out there that have enabled this this to to happen anyway. I had someone on my show not too long ago, uh uh you and I both know him, James. And James was yeah. talking about how he's now able to use tools like chat GPT to craft mm -hmm. emails that he's not been able to before. And yeah. these are the tools that are available now. I mean, this is just imagine what's going to happen in the near future when, when, yeah. um, when more tools are going to become available and, and that's going to open up a whole new section of, of, op of opportunities, of opportunities. And I love what you just said there about, you know, how do we look at creating opportunities for people like uh, for people with disabilities? I, I remember, I'll never forget this conversation I had with somebody who he was asked at job interviews, he's blind. And so he uses a screen reader and he was asked multiple times, you know, are you able to do this job or, or can you, is it possible for you to do it? And he would say, just give it to me, give me the dot. I will show you that I can do it. Or yeah. if I can't do it, let me raise my hand and tell you that I can't do yeah. it. It's not up to you to qualify, quantify if I'm able to do this. What you should be yeah. doing is just saying, here's a task. Let me know if you need any help and yeah. leave it at that. And that's a much yeah. better approach to it. I want to learn more about what does success look like for you know, a placement, a program, an internship, what does success look like? Um, success um, for us, I can tell you from the previous experience, you know, has a few critical components. One is getting in at the executive level. Uh, executive sponsorship is key because that really kind of sets the tone for what's important to the organization, what's important to the culture. Um, second, I think is um, outlining the goals, projects, deliverables. I mean, we when we do an, uh, a contract with a company, um, you know, our, the interns get paid directly as, you know, they just set them up as 1099s. And then I get a consulting fee for running the program and right. hiring people to support and stuff like that. And we have very clear goals and deliverables that are outlined because we want to um, make sure that we are putting some skin in the game. And mm -hmm. a lot of times people say, you know, I get this a lot. People say, why don't you just spin this up as a nonprofit? You'll get a lot of money, you right. can do more. Um, I'm adamant about not running this as a nonprofit, even though it may be a slightly easier route to take. Uh, I know nonprofits have a lot of challenges. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just mm -hmm. saying it's, it might be easier than doing a for-profit business. But the reason why it is a for-profit business is because I want skin in the game from everyone involved. If you are a self-advocate with a disability working with us, we expect a certain level of commitment and work ethic from you. Right. If you are an employer working with us, we expect you to learn about how what it feels like you know, what it's like to onboard employees with cognitive disabilities. It will uncover some, you know, issues you have with your employee onboarding processes, right? Yep. If you are a manager or a team member, we want you to be fully engaged and involved in making sure that it's a true win-win, right? It's a win for your organization and it's a win for the individual you're hiring. It really has to be that, Cam. And that I think is, is going to really shift the way people think about people with disabilities. Mm -hmm that the traditional um, perception is, oh, we have to help them. We have to hold their hand. Right. It's a lot of work. We are a fast paced startup. We don't have time. And I'm like, why, why is that a problem, right? Um, uh, but, but, but I think that creating those win-wins I think is, is, is very critical um, and making it fun in the process. It does not have to be all serious, right? I mean, when you, hire people with disabilities, especially people with cognitive disabilities, you will realize how much it contributes 
to a positive, uplifting culture in your company. Mm -hmm. um, it is a big shift that I think we all need given where we are. I think we are all becoming very robotic in the way we approach work. And I think it's time to humanize it. And there is no better way to humanize our work and our culture than to include people with very diverse abilities into the workforce. Um, and one final thing I'll say is, I believe in the long run, if more and more people with disabilities, all kinds of disabilities or abilities enter the workforce, we will see innovation, especially in tech. Oh, for sure. Um, reach greater heights. Right. And, you know, right now we are celebrating artificial intelligence and all the amazing things that ChatGPT does and stuff like that. And I'm very excited about it. I think it helps people with cognitive disabilities. It's mm -hmm. a great technology. But I don't think we have scraped the surface uh, with technology, with what's possible, because we have not included the perspective of a very important group of people. And when you solve for people with cognitive disabilities, something magical happens. I think you and I both know this. You actually build products that are good for everybody. Right. I see this on a daily basis, how my work with them uncovers just the most incredible um, insights on a daily basis. What if those insights were available to product teams who are building amazing technology for the future? There's so much they could do. And all it takes is for these companies to say, hey, you know, whether it's gaming or, you know, uh, consumer software or yeah. hardware, hire them into your teams, yeah. give them jobs to do, train them to use the products your company has built yeah. or the software your company has built. Don't ask me what qualifications they have. They don't have any qualifications. Mm. They don't have a resume. Right. Hire them, bring them into your teams, teach them the skills and see what happens because they will turn around and add so much value to your teams that you had never imagined was possible. Yeah. And blow you away. Like truly, like and, and absolutely blow you away. Um I want to go back to something you said about executive sponsorship because that's a big thing that I think a lot of a lot of people in our industry struggle with. Even just mm -hmm. speaking or getting to those executive sponsors to be able to talk to them about mm -hmm. a topic such as this, or I mean, other any kind of like advocacy or any kind of these um, these topics here. Uh, do you have any tidbits, strategies, techniques? What would you say to somebody who's either struggling to get in front of that sponsor or uh, is getting resistance? Yeah, so here's the thing. I b very strongly believe that we are not for everyone and everyone is not for us. Mm -hmm. This works in companies where there is a culture of inclusion, where there is there are people who believe that this is the right thing to do and it's good for business. Mm -hmm. If the conversation starts with, tell me why I should hire a person with a cognitive disability. Tell yeah, me why, yeah. what is the business case? I, I know immediately that that's not the right fit for us. Mm -hmm. If I have to convince you that you should hire people with cognitive disabilities, then we should not be having this conversation. Right, right. Uh, what I'm interested in is, and most of the times I'm very fortunate, I get to talk to people who start the conversation with, love what you're doing. Yep. Tell us how we can get started. Yep, yep. I literally had a conversation with an ex-colleague yesterday who called me out of the blue and she said, I've been seeing all your posts on LinkedIn, really impressed with what you've been able to do in a short period of time. I would love to do this at, our, at my company. Mm -hmm. Tell me how to do this. Mm -hmm. Tell me how I can get started. I've been passionate about this for years. Tell me how I can get started. Yeah. Those are the people you want to talk to. Don't waste your time with people who want you to convince them why this is the right thing to do. You're not going to be able to change their mind over this unless, you know, unless you are, uh, unless there's some motivation, right? right the right, intrinsic right. motivation is important. Mm -hmm. And and I say the same thing to people who, uh, who, who work with companies who don't believe accessibility is important. Okay, great. If it's not important, then that means you don't care about your customers. You don't right, care about right, right. Needs, it, it you shows, care about it shows you exactly what they stand for right and away. We right. all know that's not the right way to run a business. Yeah, exactly. So go, go ahead, run your business to the ground. If you don't care about accessibility, that's fine. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll figure it out somewhere down the line that it is. And when, when you do figure it out, let's come back and have the conversation. Yeah. And, and I'm, I, I don't mean to sound arrogant, but I think that when you are a bootstrapped startup like ours, self-funded, mm -hmm. I don't have investors. It's all funded by my own in my own savings. I don't have the time to waste with people who don't believe that this is the right thing to do, who don't right, believe, right. don't bang your head against, you know, the wall, like, you know, go around it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I love that you said that because this is reflecting something that, you know, a, a marketer, if you ask a marketer the same, the same kind of question, they're going to answer in a very similar way. There's, you're not going to be able to convince everybody. 
You're not no. going to be able to get everyone on board with what to. you're doing. And you're going to spend so much energy yeah. trying to convince somebody who is never, not never going to be convinced. I don't like saying that, but yeah. spend less time on that person and go find your allies. Go find your allies inside the organization. I always say the power of one. I heard, yeah. I first heard this at, at Intuit from the founder of Intuit, Scott Cook. And he said, he built the entire, the whole idea for Intuit started with one customer and it was his wife. And he saw her struggling with her checkbook at their dining table mm -hmm. day, night after night. And he said, as an engineer, I want to do something about that. And he built Quicken mm -hmm. and Quicken ended up, you know, becoming Intuit and now Intuit is this big company. It starts with the power of one. And I, that stuck with me, right? I, I spent almost a decade at Intuit and that, that one story stuck with me and my entire business today, my, my work is based on one person, mm -hmm. Rohan Bhupati Raju is a young man with Down syndrome. You may have seen his pictures and videos on our LinkedIn. Yep. He, he's one person who said, I want more out of my life. Yep. I may have a disability. I may be a person with Down syndrome, but I want more out of my life. Mm -hmm. And Rojeen Russell, young woman with cerebral palsy, I want more out of my life. And they and, you know, trusted me to help them you know, find the careers of their dreams, yep. to, to build the skills to get the career of their dreams. Those are the kinds of people you want to connect with, mm -hmm. right? Because there are many people out there who believe that there is a better way, yep. who actually want to create opportunities for people with disabilities, and, but they just don't know how to, or they don't know where to connect with them. Yep. Yep. And I think we need to change that. And, and the way to change that is to keep having these conversations and for us to keep showing the world what is possible? So I, I now I have to ask. So I hear so much about the, the giving part. Why is this important to you? Why, why did this become, you know, important to you? You know, I, um, I've thought about that long and hard and I, I spend a lot of time with myself. So I get to, I get to think about this stuff. You know, initially I thought it was because it's, it's for Rohan and Rojin and Michael and Leith and all the guys on our team. But I think that there's a very personal reason why I do this. And I've, I've come to accept that. And I think that it comes from uh, a deep rooted need to feel worthy and accepted. And to understand that more intrinsically, you ha I have to tell you a little bit about my background. When I was growing up, I grew up in a small town in South India, and I was raised to be a housewife. All my teenage years leading up to becoming an adult woman, I, I was given the education, the opportunity to you know, educate myself and stuff like that. But I always knew that by the time I turned 21, I would get married. And my destiny in life was to become a wife and have you know, my husband's children and, uh, you know, become a, a, an amazing homemaker. And, and that was acceptable it, it, because all of my role models were amazing homemakers. But my life took a turn when I married uh, my husband who lived in the U.S. and I moved here and um, introduced me to a very different way of life. And uh, it opened up doors for me that I did not know were available. And that I think was a huge pivotal shift that happened in my life where I met so many people here who looked at me and said, you can do more. You're a very capable individual. And that to me is a, is, is a privilege and it's a, an honor to be given those opportunities to really become the person that you truly are. And I have been very fortunate that I've had employers, managers, friends, colleagues, every step of the way, who have looked at me and said, Gayatri, you are capable of doing more, go for it. And that is what, what intrinsically motivates me because there is tremendous amount of hidden potential in every human being, but we are not fully realizing that because we don't have the ability to look at ourselves in that way. But when you look at others, if you see potential, you know, make sure that that potential can be harnessed, right? And, and there's tremendous amount of uh, value in that. The, the world benefits from it. I've always had an affinity for, always had a connection with people with cognitive disabilities um, from a very young age. I have family members who are people with disabilities. And um, I believe that, I think that is, that is what intrinsically motivates me is, is this tremendous amount of potential. And I believe that it's time the, the tech industry and especially employers decided to do something about it. Gayatri, thanks so much for coming on the show today. This has been absolutely fantastic. I love this conversation. I think that the work that you do is is so meaningful and thank you for everything that you do. And do you have any last takeaways for listeners to remember? I have a very strong bias for action. Yes. I, I'm a doer. Yep. 
And, uh, you know, my pet peeve is that there's so many people out there who call themselves advocates and they post all these quotes and these articles and how to's and checklists. And um, my my uh, take, you know, my suggestion or advice or whatever you want to call it is I think that's great, but take action towards, you know, those goals. Um, walk the talk, you know, help help someone today. Start by helping someone today. Um, and take that action, you know, do something tangible versus just posting on social media. I love it. I love it. Wasn't that a great episode? You probably have lots of new ideas swirling through your head right now. Now, how are you going to go and teach that to your boss, your team, or your clients? You need a strategy to move forward. Contact me today, hi at cambodwine.com, and let's talk about how we can move this forward in your organization or individual practice. If you could right now, like and subscribe to this show, it really does help grow our reach to get more people involved and interested in disability inclusion and making the world a more inclusive place. And don't forget, you can also watch this show live on LinkedIn. Just find me there. It's every Friday at noon Eastern. See you next week.